words cannot describe my feeling standing here in front of Monticello, home of my hero, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson's passion for politics is well known, but his passion for wine helped to create the wine industry in America. For today's wine-inspired menu, I'm preparing oyster dore and a saliland toast, a duck breast marinated in coriander, lavender, and elderberry, potato dauphinoise with truffles, old be followed up by an unbelievable Charlotte Alaurus, and prepare a spectacular menu, all for a taste of history. Wow, spectacular. All my life I took notes on gardens, on restaurants, on food, in every culture that I traveled through. In France, I not only personally paid attention to some of the best foods I had ever tasted in my life, but I made sure that one of my servants, James Hemmings, was trained in the art of French cookery. Lucky for me, Thomas Chevron was such an organized individual that he documented everything extremely well, what he liked to eat, to communicate to his staff. And so today I'm making a breast of duck. I have a duck in front of me. Insert my knife through here. It's really easy to do. It's just gonna follow the contour of the, the breast bone. If you make this recipe, you do not have to buy a whole duck. Every upscale butcher shop will sell you duck breast by itself, like I have in front of me here. You're just gonna penetrate the skin. What I'll do is I'll just take it and I add it into a, any kind of container. I have uh, coriander which is an interesting spice, and I take the coriander and I crush it. The reason for crushing is because if you leave them whole, you don't release the flavor of the coriander. Sprinkle it over the duck breast I got. Next, I have uh, elderberry, which I already crushed. Elderberry is just a unique flavor, just adds a unique flavor into it. What makes it really unique is an herb that Thomas Jefferson fell in love with while traveling the south of France. We have fields all over, lavender. I put oil, regular old oil, any oil you want to use. There we go, I'm going to turn it once. The marinating is so important, the flavor will come right through the meat. But it's got, you got to set it up at least overnight. And now it goes in the refrigerator. I assure you that Jefferson had a favorite wine, and it was the one of which he had a glass in front of him. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson's appreciation of wine began as a student under the tutelage of his college professor. He would continue to develop his palate during his time spent as a dignitary in France. One cannot expect to develop such uh, refinement, such attention, such understanding of the palate if one does not apply himself. And I certainly applied myself with, with what I hope stands as a scientific attention. Thomas Jefferson was uh, the first wine connoisseur in America. The reason is very simple. In America, they were drinking only oxidated wine, like sherry, marsala, uh, Madeira. So Jefferson is the first one who really started to promote non-oxidated wine. Jefferson's interest in wine grew more sophisticated after meeting Italian horticulturalist Philippe Metze. Both men understood that the climate in Virginia was similar to that of the Mediterranean, and that the Virginia soil was conducive to growing fruit trees. I used my gardens as a laboratory, constantly experimenting, grafting, trying to see what might survive in the climate of Virginia. It was a never-ending source of fascination for me. Jefferson's knowledge would both provide and inspire his fellow founding fathers. He helped them to find the right wine. He shipped wine for them when he is in France, tell them how important it was during a meal to have a glass of wine. The species which are grown in America were different from the one which are grown in Europe. So when, you know, Jefferson got to France, he's inspired by the variety that he finds there, and that's what he want to bring here. Despite Jefferson's knowledge and his vast amounts of resources, he was never able to achieve the success of producing the European vine at Monticello due to issues of pestilence, such as the phylloxera bug, a small pest that would destroy the vines. Over the years, I grew 
over 70 different basic plant varieties, but within those varieties, I constantly experimented. The failure of one plant was ever repaired by the success of a new one. It must have been difficult when they first planted all those grapevines in here and then to find out later the experiment didn't really work out for them. Huh? Even if Jefferson was not successful in growing grapes, he was certainly successful in keeping his cellar full of wine. Because he knew what he had. He had money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So my duck breasts are in the refrigerator. So now I make an oyster doré. First step is make the bechamel, which is no more than a little butter and some shallots already got cut. The shallots should be just translucent, no color. I'm making a very small batch for this particular uh, dish I'm making. So I'm doing something I normally don't do. I add flour into my uh, butter and shallots, which we refer to as a white roux because I'm only making such a small amount, I don't have to worry about uh, burning. So now I got milk and cream, and a whisk, back on the fire, a little bit of liquid, so now we're going to bring this to a boil, but now it's thick enough already, I'm adding in uh, oyster liquor. Oyster liquor is the liquid when you shock the oyster to come out. Lots of nutmeg, cannot make so special maybe without freshly ground nutmeg, salt, white pepper, and a good amount of parsley or any herb you like. You could put the chives, any herb will work. Mix it all up. The consistency is just perfect. So now I'm getting ready on the oysters, and I need an expert. I have an expert who works for me in the city town, Chef de Cassin, Bill. Hey, Bill. Chef. Good to be doing? here. So here we have Malapique oysters. They grow in salt rivers. So they're pretty briny with a clean finish. The first thing you do is you want to get into right here, which is the shoe of the horn, all right? So I like to just kind of get my knife in, and then I pop, and then I'll shuck, and you can hear the shucking sound. Perfect. All right. And you loosen it. So then what I want to do is I want to loosen this one single uh, muscle here, so I want to come in and I want to scrape it against the shell. That's your shuck. All right. And then you're going to hand it to me. Oh. Is that good? And this is how you eat an oyster. Never made a cocktail for it. Because so you want the flavor of the, 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 bay. the bay. You feel the ocean. You feel the little salt in the sun. And you feel exactly, like I said, the brightness. So while Bill is shucking a couple more oysters, I'm going to get started on the salinan. If you choose to make this recipe, you may find Texas toast, which is on the thicker side. And so now what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna trim it down, and the excess goes off on the side. I'm gonna put some butter in my spider, and you might wonder why I, why I cook it in butter, it's excess flavor. Oh, the flavor, look at that. That's gorgeous, <laughs> perfect. Couldn't do it any better than that, look at that. For the oyster, we're gonna do a, a real quick doré on it, which is just a, a, an egg batter. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna season the flour first. I'm gonna use a little bit of cayenne pepper. To kick up. Just kick to get up. a little bit of heat, a little bit of back of the throat kind yeah. of feel. Next, I'm gonna add a little bit of ground white pepper. And that's gonna be more of a flavor profile there. Then the last is gonna be paprika. Paprika is what's actually gonna help brown it. The inside of the oyster's gotta be moist the outside is gonna be crispy. So it's a not as simple a dish as you may think because you have a tendency to overcook the oyster. Not good. And you crack a couple eggs. Shake off the excess flour. Just wanna make sure that these are covered nice. I want the flavor of butter, but I don't want the burning quality because it's gonna take a, a few minutes for this. So there's a neat little trick what you could do is you go 50-50 with butter and oil you get the qualities of a high smoking point with the oil with no burning, but you don't lose the flavor of the butter. Take them out individually, shake a little bit off, not too much, and when you put them in the pan, throw them away from you so you do not splash oil on yourself. Okay, so we got about a, about a minute, minute and a half here, so I want to turn one. I just want to give them about another minute, minute and a half. You don't want to overcook an oyster. When you see the uh, gills of an oyster start to curl up, that's Mother Nature telling you that the oysters are now finished. The toast is here. I'm gonna to put the bechamel over it. The bechamel is really what gives this 
unbelievable flavor to it. Now I'll put the oysters on top. It's a whole lot of work for a toast, but then again, on a taste of history, if you don't mind work. It's a beautiful dish, it's clean, it's simple, but yet very elegant. For a true enthusiast, a small wine rack would never work. Let's go to Monticello and check out Thomas Jefferson's unbelievable wine cellar. Chef Walter, welcome to Monticello. This is a, a, a beautiful little spot. It is the wine cellar. Jefferson decided to build this part of the house before any other part of the house. Interesting. I know about Jefferson, I read about Jefferson, I sometimes think I talk to him, so I always <laughs> knew I had to come back here. When Jefferson started to send wine to the United States, in the beginning he was just in a barrel, and then he realized that during the trip, somebody was tasting the wine and replacing what he was drinking with water. So he decided that the best thing to do was to stay away from the middleman, to ship it already bottled. It was sealed in France and it was coming here in perfect condition. There is a, a myth, or maybe it's true, that when he was finished with the presidency, all the wine that was left in the White House all came up here, right into the cellar. Is that kind of correct? Well, I wasn't here, so yeah. I cannot <laughs> tell you. <laughs> the dumb waiter is also a wonderful thing because you understand that at that time the wine was not filtered so they were always a deposit so it was very very important to bring up the bottle you know one bottle at a time up to the dining room right yeah. and so that was also a very safe way to bring the wine upstairs with the dumb waiter in a vertical you know position and then you know pour it very carefully this is actually an interesting bottle because it has the classic indentation that all the bottles had at the time. When you pour a bottle of wine and the bottle has the indentation, the sediment will Just sort of stay on the bottom, right? There was not cold stabilization, there was no control of the proteins, so the sediment was pretty big. The other thing that I love actually is the color of the bottle that Jefferson had. You understand how important it was at the time to have the dark glasses because they understood the sun was destroying the wine. The sun is the enemy of the wine, but not the enemy of the grapes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So now the duck breast. It marinated overnight in a refrigerator. Basically what you want to do is you want to take it out the marinade and just pat it dry. The best way to do it is take any paper, kitchen towel. Now we're going to go over to my heart, insert them, and you want to have a real sear on it. No fat, nothing in the pan. Sprinkle a little salt over it. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate my Dutch pot quick just to get more, more heat on the other side. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. The flavor of the herbs, the flavor of the duck, and the duck fat is just perfect. So now, on that side, I would say about three, three minutes to four minutes, depending also how you want to eat it. If you cook it at home, on a regular uh, commercial stove, I say maybe five to six minutes each side should do it, not much longer than that. Let me just check one more time quick. When you touch it with your hands and it doesn't resist, it means it's well done. So you want to have a little bounce back. So this one right now is just the way I like it, medium wear. I take it off right now and let it sit right here. So now this one is sitting here, I can lit it. So it's never difficult to figure what to serve with any protein when you cook for Thomas Jefferson. Peas was his favorite vegetable. And the mushrooms, he loved portobello. And cremini is a baby portobello. Cremini, I'm just going to cut up a little bit like so. Thomas Jefferson, being from Virginia, would barely eat anything without the inclusion of Virginia ham or regular bacon. What I'm doing right now, I have some bacon ready cut. That's going to go in my Dutch, it's super hot. Bacon first. Shallots. Get a little bit of butter. Snow peas. No piece back on the fire. And I'm gonna deglaze just maybe a spoon of chicken stock. You can use white wine, anything works. And those ones don't take any time whatsoever to cook, like a stir fry. Have salt and pepper. 
And now comes the cremini mushroom. Now it's time to move the duck over. So let's look. All right, now I'm going to do the duck first here to let it rest up a little bit. Oh, here we go. The bottom of the pan, which is full of flavor, you'll get a few shallots in there. Some red wine. And it's going to go back on the fire. Just for a little bit of heat to reduce it down. Get the wedge already. Next thing, I'm going to slice the duck breast. So I'm going to take the first one out. I'm going to cut it nice on the bias. Oh gosh, I can't even. It's just perfect. Now the sauce is getting ready in the back. A little bit of demi. Taking the sauce over. Yep, beautiful. Room temperature butter. And now I'm going to whisk it under. You wait until the butter is melted out. You see how the sauce is changing its color and its complexity. And there's nothing better than butter, red wine, shallots, a little bit of bacon. Wow. And all the flavor of the duck breast is right in there. It's like, oh. And here, Mr. Jefferson, there you go, your duck breast. Don't get better than that. So this particular recipe I found and I thought to myself, wow, kind of strange because it's a very unique, very, 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 very French recipe. What uh, would have taken him some time to train his culinarians up there in Monticello because it's not easy. So the first thing we've done right now, we've done a pâte à choux. So a pâte à choux is translated from French as cabbage paste. There's no cabbage. So the idea behind a cabbage paste is when you portion them out and they bake up, they look like a little head of cabbage. Many of the cookbooks in this country, you can find this recipe easy because anybody who wants to make a cream puff will use that as a base. So this is only half. Now we're gonna add potatoes. We wanna put the potatoes in and we're gonna use what's called a ricer. This is also used for making noodles, spatula. Well, not me, instance. I make it by, by the board, but mm -hmm. yes. But yes. <laughs> This is why it's called a ricer, how it comes out and it looks like actual rice. 50% pot pot de choux, de choux 50%. and 50% dried steamed potatoes. They gotta steam out completely. All the, the liquid has gotta be evaporated out. You gotta mix it good, otherwise when you put it in the grease, it's gonna pop open on you. Now some may pop in anyway, but this is perfectly okay. And, and the way that you shape them is just shape them with a spoon. And a little bit of some salt, salt in there for you a little bit, just a tad. A little white pepper. I give you a little bit of parsley, just actually parsley. Just gets a nice little color right. to it. And at this point, we could actually make these. Yeah, of course. We're, we're going to make it a little different today. So, since Thomas Jefferson was such a Renaissance man, and he, I knew he fell in love with truffles while traveling to the south of France, and pe people asked me earlier, why is it called truffle? like the chocolate truffle, why? Because it looks like a truffle, the way it grows. So if you go to a pastry shop and you ask for chocolate truffle, you're not getting that. You're actually getting a chocolate truffle. The reason it's so unique, it's very, very, very expensive. It's kept in my office, in my personal refrigerator. And now I'm chopping that. Make that a little fine brunoise. Very, very fine, more than fine. And we're ready to go. And the truffle goes in. Bill is going to add some nutmeg in there. That's really great flavor that comes out of the truffle, especially when it gets fried. That's it, it's going to mix it up. We have our hot oil over here. And you never want to put your fingers in the oil. Not a good idea. I do these little sweeping motions to make sure that it's nice and smooth. So now you just want to let it cook until golden brown. We just want to get some nice color to it. And this is beautiful eating to get with them with the duck. There you go, chef. Careful, they're hot. Nothing is ever hot for me. I cook on open fire, as you know. Wow, a little bit of truffle I put in there. I can smell it from here. It's a perfect accompaniment to this unbelievable meal in honor of Thomas Jefferson. For the menu I prepared, I needed a very special dessert. And for that, I needed my pastry chef from the city town of Diana to come here and help me because I couldn't do that myself, I admit it. I'm happy to help, it's great to be here. We're gonna get started and the dish we're making is a classical dish called Charlotte a la Russe. 
I'm gonna start with some eggs here. We need them separated. So I'm going to put the whites into your bowl over here, one at a time, being careful not to break them. And the yolks over here into my bowl. We need five whites and four yolks. I'm gonna have you start making a meringue. Get it nice and whipped and foamy and slowly add your little bowl of sugar over there. I'm gonna whisk these together with a little bit of lemon juice and some more sugar. Just gonna dump that straight in and I'm gonna get mine going to a good ribbon state. So now we're gonna fold these two together very, very gently, of course. We just whipped all that beautiful air into it. We don't want to deflate it all now. The main reason for this is you want the lady finger to be really fluffy afterwards. So that's yes. the, the beauty. Shake so some bread flour together with some cornstarch. You'll notice there's no chemical leaveners or anything like that. So we are relying on all of that whipped egg to really hold up throughout the entire process. And that's it. That's the whole batter. Two pans. One is going to be for our bottom round. We need a nine inch circle. We're going to make a big 10 inch Charlotte. Cake, Charlotte, yes, of course. Second pan to do the lady fingers. The lady fingers. Not my fingers. <laughs> so then in the beehive it goes, 350 you say, seven to eight minutes until they're firm, right? They have to be firm. That's right, nice dark color and firm to the touch. Okay, so we have our base here and our lady fingers. We just piled them all up. You need a fair amount to make one this size, about 30 to 40 fingers. So we have our 10 inch pan here with a removable bottom, mm -hmm. just enough space around the edge for me to slide the fingers down in. A little patience and it'll get there. Well, it makes the beauty afterwards. And what most people don't realize how this comes together. People always are mind boggled when they see something like that. Just about there, maybe two, one more, two more. Nice skinny one. Perfect. Gonna add some milk. Good, good vanilla extract. If you'll take that over to the fire for me and get it scalding. Yep. I'll work on getting the eggs all whipped up. Nice and loose in there. And to that, I'm gonna add a whole bunch of sugar. There we go. Oopa. Okay. Wonderful. Just perfect. Excellent. Just wanna slowly add it so that we don't scramble our yolks. Back to the stove. Yes, sir. And I'm gonna keep mixing while it's on the stove until it's just slightly thickened. We have just a little bit of powdered gelatin, unflavored, and three tablespoons of rum. And that'll just we'll soften and melt. Check on this. Beautiful. Get nice and thick. Grab our custard. Top that over here. Perfectly melted gelatin. Whisk it in. This custard here. Beautiful, yes. Hold the strainer, I'll pour it in. You let it cool off, then the last moment you fold the whipped cream under it. That's right, two and a half cups to Hold a nice it. soft peak. We're just gonna fold these two together right into our setup here. And out comes the one that is fully set. And at this point, you could choose almost any flavor you want. It's got big old chunks of apricot. Fresh apricots, got a couple sliced up there. Perfect Charlotte a la Russe. All right, but you need to try it yourself. Okay, don't have to ask mm. me twice. It's absolutely sensational. Excellent. In tribute of Thomas Jefferson. Walter, it was great to get you back to Monticello and it's wonderful the fact that we end up to be next to the vineyard with a little bottle of wine made with grapes grown in Monticello. You are a legend uh, as it comes to preserving Thomas Jefferson's philosophy. And uh, if Thomas Jefferson could look down at the two of us today, what would you think? Uh, I think that if he could be here with us and looking at us, he would say, I don't want to die. I want to stay forever here and enjoy the beautiful job that you are doing. <laughs> Gabriel, thanks for having me back in Monticello. It was wonderful to have you here. A vote santé. A vote santé to Thomas Jefferson and Monticello for a taste of history.